Welcome! In this video we will interact with the XRP Ledger using Python. So this is just an introductory um, video where we'll show you how we can do the entire setup. And the first thing we're going to need is we're going to need an IDE, so an integrated development environment. So I will be using PyCharm, so that's uh, by JetBrains. I generally speaking really like the development environments they're providing there. And you can, you can get the community edition and download one, it's free. Or you can also get a professional version. If you're attending university or still a student, you can apply for a free license. Right, so I'm gonna pause the video and install it. Right, so the setup is simple, so I assume that most of you already have installed a program on your computer, but let's go through with it together. So you obviously have to give it admin permission to write to the directories. We just can continue, continue, boring. Now you can decide if you want shortcuts. Uh, we don't not want the file extensions there, or well, actually the Py is fine. Uh, so, so the file extension that uh, .p, p, p, py extensions are on files automatically opened with PyCharm. Uh, and I'm gonna pause again, so that's quite self-explanatory. One thing we're gonna do in the meantime is we will need Python. Uh, so right now we're just installing an IDE, so let's say a text editor with advanced capabilities. But we'll also need Python on the machine itself, so I'm gonna download Python. So we just enter Python download, in this case for the respective um, operating system, in my case it's Windows. So I'm just gonna click on that, I'm just gonna click on install now, submit, and yeah, just go on there. In the meantime, let's go back to the PyCharm uh, installing process. All right, we finished it, we're gonna click on run PyCharm. Um, yeah, okay, right, I'm, I'm asking too much from the virtual machine here. Yep, it's not happy. All right, so I'm gonna pause again. All right, so it's successfully installed PyCharm, so we're just gonna click on it twice to open it. And yeah, we're just gonna consent there. We don't want to uh, submit uh, anonymized uh, stats, and I'm not able to say that even, cool. Uh, we're gonna start the trial, and ah, oh, damn it. Uh, well, and then you have to activate it. Usually they don't require an account beforehand, so I'm gonna log in quickly. All right, so installed the community edition. was right now too lazy to reset the account and whatever the password and all of that. So let's go on here. So, um, right, so this is the starting screen and we're gonna just create a new project. We're just gonna call it whatever, call it PyTor, just XOP test project. Um, right, it automatically selects the interpreter. So this is the, the thing I just installed before. And also, yeah, let's find all of that. So we're just gonna go to create here. And uh, now our fancy text editor is starting with the IDE, in this case PyCharm. Um, so we can close this tip here, it's just to get to getting more used to the development environment itself. And the first thing we can do is just start a program, doing a right click and saying run in this case. So as soon as everything loads here, and maybe I'm also gonna make a call here in this case, we're gonna print high, and we're gonna make a method call here, and just gonna say XOP dev. So right now I'm calling the function print high up here, and this one is just gonna greet me, and I'm just gonna click on the play button up there. So hi PyCharm and hi XOP dev. So this is the other part. Oh yeah, it's the main here, my bad. Uh, Right, so it's also showing us that one here. All right, cool. So, and I'm just gonna do the line there. And now we're gonna do some stuff. Um, now we're gonna try to interact with the XP Ledger. So the first thing we're gonna need is we're gonna need additional libraries. So we can see here that, so there's a perfect guide. And the first thing we have to do is we need the XPL Pi library, that one there. So just click on that. Uh, we can also see the uh, we can see codes examples and uh, what the current method is. And we're going to use pip free to install it. Um, well, I'm just going to hope for now. Uh, when less, I will have to, to do. I have pip free in, in PowerShell. Maybe. Now it doesn't look like it. Uh, well, I will quickly look it up. Okay, great. So just change the command prompt. So if you go if you go back to terminal there. You can click on this part there, click on command prompt. I'm also gonna set it as default. I'm just gonna quickly do that. So right now it's always getting the PowerShell, but I want the normal command prompt to open. 
And uh, now we can just make a call for pip3 in this case. And you can see here right now, the uh, our pip3 is installed here. And now we're just gonna copy and paste. It's the easiest part. You can just click on the clipboard there and paste it down here. So now we did it. And then just press enter. So right now it's downloading the module or slash the packages and setting all of that up. Great, so everything looks good. Um, yeah, we can, why not? We can also make the call to upgrade pip, but let's do it later. Um, right, so now let's do the first part here. Again, you can just click on the clipboard and copy again. It's super simple. So as you can see, these startup guides uh, are also quite, yeah, quite nice. Uh, right, so let's start right here. So we can just do a print. Nothing fails so far. You don't have to do a print statement, I'm just doing it for debugging purposes. So right now it's awesome. So it works, the import is working, and also the uh, JSRPC client, which is being initialized, it didn't fail as well. So now we're gonna start doing something. Um, right, so that's fine. We don't want to connect to production. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna create a wallet. So let's also copy that part there. It's lots of copy and paste. So that's how program works to uh, about 70% of the time. So, right, so we can also remove the comments there. So that's the next part. Now we've got a wallet. Why is this grayed out? Ah, too many blank lines. Okay, sure, my ID knows better than me. Um, right, so we've got here, we're just generating a wallet more or less, generating faucet wallets. We give it the client and set the work to true. All right, what else is going on there? Uh, we obviously we get a wallet instance and we can also print it out. So we just we just need to can do a print statement. So we don't have to copy it down there. That's the actual output. So we're just going to do a print statement and print out the test wallet. So just click on the play button on the top right again. So right now um, we can also track that. So right now what is happening here? So we are creating the RPC client. We're generating a test wallet, but also uh, funding it. So the testnet has a funding method where it puts about whatever, where it sends 1,000 XRP to a newly created account. You can see here, this account was just generated in a testnet. If you want to see the testnet, we can just enter testnet.xrpl.org. There we can watch it live and also we can go to test.bithom.com to use Bithom on the testnet. And if I just paste the account address here now, we can see that this account just has 1,000 XRP on it. So we funded that one with our generate, uh, uh, funded whatever, uh, generate faucet wallet. So if I run the program again, and quickly look now at the live net here, it's gonna be a re green dot in a second here. We can see that our test wallet is gonna be funded, that one here. So here you can see that we just funded, communicated to the testnet, and the testnet funded our wallet with 1000 XRP. That, that obviously doesn't work on the live net, uh, but it's perfect for, yeah, for these purposes of testing. All right, so everything is going great so far. So the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go, um, we're gonna go back, right? And we're gonna go to, um, ah, I'm gonna lost track here, right. And we're gonna continue here. So we're gonna prepare payment. So again, just click on the clipboard part there. We're just gonna copy again, it's super simple. Uh, so what are we doing here? Uh, Python is just a hashtag, prepare a payment transaction. That's what we're doing here. Just paste it again. And now we can define where we, from where it's being sent from. And um, it's the account is just the test wallet dot and classic address. Hopefully it did correctly here. So we just have to check one more time because I just think it wants the, I just want to check the data type. Okay, hopefully it's fine. So maybe we'll have to change it, but okay. I'm not, I'm not pouring Python that often. Okay, right, so then the amount we can, for example, let's send XOP to drops, um, right? Um, this is just a method of, uh, yeah, it, it's XOP to drops, it converts um, the XOP amount into drops. So it just multiplies these 22 to, uh, times a million. The idea is that you, when you want to do a payment in XOP, you're always sending, declaring the amount in drops. And that's why there's a function, so, you can, so it's more readable. So for example, I want to send 10 XOP to, well, let's take another account, we can also generate one. So if we just go to XOP address, let's just generate quickly an address here. Or not, okay, let's go. Great, let's take it down here. Okay, and then we're gonna send the payment to this destination address. 
Alright, so now we will prepare the payment, but it's not being done until we submit it to the extrapolator. So we prepare the payment. Uh, and the next step is signing, because we can't submit a payment transaction unless it's signed by us. So we're gonna just copy that part again. Like I said, it's just copy and paste. So now we have to sign the transaction. I think the comment is also in there. Yeah, sign the transaction, exactly that one here. Then we have here my transactions payment transaction payment signs, saves an autofill transaction and a method we're gonna call my payment and the test wall and the client. So all of these we don't have to change anything here. Just for the understanding, we have the transaction itself, we have to give it a payment transaction because we have in the payment transaction to define uh, uh, how the payment works. So we're saying we're sending it from our account, we're sending 10 XRP, and it shall be delivered to this address. Then we're defining from which wallet shall it be sent from. So we're saying this one here. Uh, and to be more exact, actually, with which wallet should this tr transaction be signed? Because this wallet here signs the transaction, that one there. And then we have to give it a connection to the testnet or live net, so the client, because then with the client it knows where it has to submit the request to. And the final step is sending, submitting the transaction to the network, to the Exoplager network. And it's also quite simple, so we don't have to do anything there. And actually we're just gonna also print the transaction response, so we can see if it worked. And yeah, that's it, so we're just gonna start and let's hope that nothing happens here we can also have a look at the live net again I'm too slow unfortunately okay faucet fund was successful so it's probably that one here so our address was rpq whatever yep that looks good and there's a transaction to the other account which we did I guess so this is the funding uh, so we got so our account got funded so this is the faucet fund successful and the other part was we were sending 10 XRP to this address, to so the R3FG, whatever. And yeah, that was successful. We just did our first payment using Python on the Exopol, so interacting with the Exopol Ledger. And as we can see here, 10 XRP was sent to this account. And yeah, if we just call, uh, click on play again, then another 10 XRP will be delivered to this account. So for, in this case, again, from another address, because we have a general faucet wallet, so it gen always generates a new wallet. And if we just have a look here again, we can see that now the balance is 20 XRP. So the now 10 XRP have arrived. And if we want, for example, to repeat that, to so send more than that, then we can just repeat the steps. And just, for example, as a loop, four, uh, four, I in range, whatever, zero, five. And then we can, for example, do five transactions. Ah, oh, damn it. Did I do wrong? Oh, okay, there's just the white space missing. Okay, the formatting. Okay, great, then let's just start again. And uh, now it would do, oh, uh, started Exodus, my bad. And now we can do funded five times. So we'll just have a look at the live net again. And there should be now five green dots at any point, well, soon. Right, so the first one has gone through. Let's wait for the second one. So this, the, so this is probably the first one, I guess. Yeah, it's the first one. It's the second one. Then the third one is happening right now. Oh, there's the no, it's our Q, not not ours. R four. That's the third one. And two more, and then we're done. All right, and if we have now a look at that one here, now five more transactions have arrived, and now we're at 70. And yeah, that's how it works. So we did our first transaction using Python and communicating with the RPC client with the Exit Ledger. And I will also, well, I'm just gonna do it live here. Uh, what is it? Paste bin. I'm just gonna also um, give you the source code. So the author in this case, syntax highlighting is to Python in this case. It's public and the only interesting either Python XRP, the XOPL payment. Okay, payment Python. All right, I'm also going to share the source code so you can just copy that if you're too if you, if you don't want to copy it yourself. 
because you can, um, go, I'm also going to share all the other links and yeah, that's how it works. So I hope this is a good introduction how you can get started uh, with the Exo Pledger using Python and yeah, see you in the next video.